So real quick, before we do introductions, let me just uh, explain a little bit the loose framework that we've proposed for the afternoon sessions from here on out. Um, at the University of Chicago M&A conference um, recently, we introduced this case concept of East Corporation buying West Corporation, and you will saw that case uh, distributed. It, we're going to use that as a little bit of a loose framework in which to debate and discuss some of the issues. Um, we're not going to be limited to it or, or handcuffed by it, but it might provide an interesting way to think about the issues, whether one is on the buy side or on the sell side. And so the reference of East Corporation and West Corporation may flow through the afternoon sessions. And so we'll see if that becomes an enabler to talk perhaps candidly about some of the challenges and issues. In particular, if things happen after you sign before you close, which is the spirit of this next discussion. We're going to try and explore some of the key issues here. So uh, Kristen Moran, who is a partner at EY and uh, a repeat um, session leader for us, has been gracious enough to, uh, uh, to come out to San Francisco to lead this next session. Do you want to do the intros of the gang? Sure. Okay. We're happy to. Okay. Yeah, we on the can fly. Kind of go okay. Down go the for line, it. I'll, I'll leave it in your hands. <laughs> no, thank you, William. We're excited to be here, and I'm I'm happy to be the one asking the questions. But we've got some pretty sharp panelists here who I think will have some interesting insights. Um, so Tim White, go ahead and introduce so, yeah, yourself. I'm we'll Tim go on White, down. I'm a principal with EY. I lead U.S. cyber investigations. Before I was with EY, I was with the FBI. I led the largest cyber squad in the U.S. for the FBI. Hi, uh, my name is John Adams. I'm Senior Privacy Counsel at LinkedIn Corporation. Uh, before I was there, I worked at two multinational law firms on privacy, data security, and the M&A context. Brian Weimer, I'm a partner at Shepard Mullen in Washington, D.C. I lead the telecom team, so the telecom practice, which is really companies regulated by the FCC. I don't profess to be a privacy expert, but I do a lot of M&A uh, that's highly regulated, and I think the issues are quite similar to what you see in the telecom context as well. Awesome, thank you, gentlemen. I mean, we've we've talked a lot so far today, um, you know, entirely around the M&A market and how deals are increasingly moving at a very quick pace. Um, we're all kind of moving at the speed of light sometimes. It seems like our our plates are constantly full, and there's so many opportunities out there. So we thought it would be an interesting. Oh, do we need to? Oh, no worries. It's me and microphones. I like making other people wear them. You know. It's his FBI background. He doesn't, want, he doesn't want anybody to hear what he's saying. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> so we thought it would be an interesting conversation to kind of, you know, let's, let's talk through this hypothetical data breach that's happening amidst a transaction and how we would cope with that. I think that's a question that probably many of us in the room might be thinking to ourselves, oh my gosh, I don't even know how, how we would deal with that. So. We'll kind of walk through the timeline and progression of this hypothetical data breach. So we're at that kind of, oh my goodness moment, right? Where a breach has been identified and we'd, we want to think about what our next steps are. So putting, putting our hats on as the seller, because the target's still in our control and we know, um, we know that this breach has been identified. What are those first one, two, three steps? What, is the, what are the first 24, 48 hours look like? Um, from your perspective? From a seller perspective, uh, whatever you think you know on day zero or day one will be wrong. In 24 hours after that, uh, everything you thought was going to be true is not going to be true. So it's really important to start preserving evidence, finding where the intrusion may be, and start locking things down. So I, I guess that's the main takeaway. Don't think you know what's really happening on day zero. Yeah, I mean, that's absolutely true. And, and it becomes something of a, you know, even in the context of an M&A deal where there's a lot going on, if you discover a potentially massive cyber issue, it becomes like an instantaneous you know, red flag. You know, deal decision makers should probably be informed fairly quickly once you have an idea that something is happening. You may not know all the details, but it's worth at least letting people that are involved in the negotiation know something's up so that they don't get blindsided later by a discussion about what's happening and saying, where did this come from? Why didn't I know? How long have you known this? Right. So you need to start thinking about at least having these conversations fairly quickly. So talking about this kind of incident response and thinking about your incident response plan, what, what, should, what should a strong incident response plan look like? And should that incident response plan include those reach outs to anybody involved in deals or, or any other comments that you guys might have around the plan itself? So I, it's, if it exists. Yeah, I think one of the first things, and I'll keep it succinct, one of the first things that I look for in incident response plans is escalation. Usually incident response plans are not very technical documents, they're about process. 
So the question is, how are incidents getting escalated and who's being informed and when? That is the critical issue. Most breaches that we handle are, uh, are the result of small breaches that weren't handled well. Yeah. And that, and that makes total sense. I mean, one of the things like I've seen and in, in having looked at a lot of different incident response plans, information security policies, other kind of documents like that in the context of M&A is that there are a lot of companies that have information, you know, security policies or incident response plans that say one thing, but they haven't been tested. Um, or they say one thing and it doesn't really fit their organization. You know, someone could buy basically an off the shelf uh, incident response plan put together by like the SANS Institute or someone like that and say that they've got an incident response plan so if anyone comes asking in diligence or if a regulator wants to look into them they can show hey look we've got something but that doesn't really help you if, if you're in the middle of you know a data breach and it's you know an M&A context or if it's happening right before you have you know SEC filings if you're a public company you need to have something that actually works that's tailored to your business that you know, at some point like is actually going to work with you know appropriate escalation chain so that the uh, important decision makers are aware of things when they happen I would add just from because I'm the lawyer right so yeah, I'm representing like, somebody who's the lawyer getting called right uh, the number one thing that I want to know before I call anybody is exactly what happened and what you pointed out is that it's hard to know immediately so a lot of times people they want to start calling the other side, the buyer, and I'm like, just let's hold on, wait, 20, usually 24 hours, you learn a lot uh, about the situation. And so my number one thing is don't start telling the other side until we know really what the facts are. Right. And that can take a little bit of time. And it's, it's both in the M&A context and also you have to think about whether disclosures are required to the regulator as well, right? And in my experience, again, my experience is really at the FCC, um, you get no uh, brownie points for disclosing something. Honestly, you just get punished even more. And so it's, it, you have to be careful of how you um, understand the facts and then how you present what has happened to the regulator. And part of that is actually a lot of times companies, uh, whether it's a breach or some other potential violation, if they don't have the mechanics in place to deal with it, that's a, a sort of another strike against you. So to the extent you can you know, develop some com something before you actually go to the regulator, it can help the situation. Yeah, one, one thing I would also add is, you know, thinking about regulators, right? A lot of companies think, oh, I've got a, a data breach, I need to report to the FTC in some cases, or the FCC in other cases. Um, sometimes you're, you know, before you even get to that point, you're dealing with other government entities like the FBI or the Secret Service or some other law enforcement agency that might have their own view about what you should or should not disclose and to whom you should or should not disclose it, right? Um, if you're dealing with, say, uh, like an APT, like you're dealing with a, an advanced persistent threat that's you know, originating from you know, a former you know, Soviet bloc country, country or Russia or China or something like that, and it's actually something that's act actively being monitored by a secret service, they probably would not like you to be talking about that in a public you know, uh, disclosure schedule that's gonna go in front of the world potentially, right? So um, there's a lot of different considerations that come into play when you start talking to regulators and law enforcement that might shape, depending on the facts, like how you approach it within your own company, with the buyer and with the world you know, writ large. And uh, it's not just a technical exercise. So you got to get this under privilege, especially in the U.S., get it under privilege as quickly as possible. Um, there is a whole technical thing that needs to get done, and the sysadmins are going to want to do that, but understand the real threat to the company or the deal is going to be all the legal fallout or regulatory fallout that comes from a single piece of malware on a single server. Yeah, and, and one thing that's important there, and I don't mean this to like as an endorsement of EY necessarily, but that's okay. having having <laughs> having, <laughs> having your lawyers, you know, whether it's your in-house lawyers, but oftentimes your outside counsel hire a forensics expert like EY to do the analysis can protect that analysis uh, under privilege in many cases. So yeah. it's right. just something to think about. The, and the other, like we've talked about the FBI and the, these sort of law enforcement folks. You talked about the regulator. It's also a delicate issue of when you disclose it to the buyer, right? Absolutely. Because you want to, it's a critical for any deal to maintain credibility and transparency throughout the process. But if you say something too soon, it turns out you're not right, then it looks like you've lost control of the situation. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you have the facts and you really understand where you are and you know it's gonna have an impact on the deal, it's, it's absolutely appropriate to get on the phone with the right people. Sometimes it's principle to principle, leave the lawyers off the phone and just say, you know, look, we have something to disclose, we have to tell you about it, and it's critical for your credibility in the deal process to do that at the right time. 
which is quickly, but you got to get the facts right first. Yeah, I, th I think that's a very strategic conversation and decision point. And, and the last thing you want, of course, is the rare but potential scenario that the buyer discovers it before you do, <laughs> right? So the buyer has engaged their own diligent, you know, cyber diligence experts, they're auditing and evaluating your systems and they discover something your own team doesn't, then, it w then you know, all cards are off the table. It's gonna be a very interesting uh, negotiation at that point. Yeah, if it even continues, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, that's, that's a great point and thinking thinking about when you, when you bring that buyer under the tent, because you don't want to do it immediately, but there's you, you can't wait a month or a year or whatever. No, and, the deal be done. Um, <laughs> understanding that the timeline of even getting your hands around the breach is obviously varies by any um, any type of scheme that was perpetrated, but thinking about, you know, you're going to be bringing them in while the investigation is still really ongoing, right? So let's think about it now from the buyer's perspective. So um, putting your buyer's head on and you've just been told about this, let's assume that you didn't find it yourself and that the sellers are disclosing this to you and you're um, starting to become into the fold um, in terms of information. What are your primary concerns as buyer and what are some considerations around um, getting, getting comfort with how the seller is handling it and if you would bring in other experts or anything like that? Yeah, so what I would say is that you kind of go back to elementary school and you start asking who, yeah. what, yeah. why, yeah. where, yeah. when, yeah. how, <laughs> these kind of basic questions and just you know, start having this conversation where you start to learn everything you can about it, who knows about it, when they learn about it, when it happened, how it happened as far as they understand it, all the information. I mean, if you're the buyer, you want to know everything you can know in order to make an informed decision about whether or not this is actually going to be a you know, material risk to your company if you acquire this other company. Yeah, from a technical perspective, uh, one case we just did very similar to this, like what is the earliest date of attacker activity? So when was the first time you saw them inside your network? And what is the artifact that we have that they were inside your network? And is that a cause artifact? Is that a cause artifact or an effect artifact? If it's like a file being created on a computer, well, how did it get there? And if you're talking about just an effect and not a cause, that means they don't know the cause. And that, that could be a bigger issue. So. I would say there are two things that I would think about as the counsel in the situation. The first is um, whether the breach or problem, whatever the problem is, um, how it impacts the executability of the deal, right? Is it something that's gonna delay a closing so that you, don't, you can't really even talk about doing a deal for a while? Because some problems are so bad, right? It's gonna lead to some kind of investigation and then suddenly maybe you can't do the deal right away. So, so if you already signed the deal, then you're talking about termination, right? If you haven't signed the deal, then you're thinking about, is this a deal that I wanna do? Because it's created uh, uncertainty around the target. That's the first question. If you get past whether the deal is still executable, then I think the question is, how material is it? And then is there some, you know, is there a, a purchase price adjustment is one issue. Um, <clears throat> if it's a relatively small thing, maybe you wanna make sure that you the indemnification provisions of the agreement, um, you know, if there is a basket that this is covered, you know, dollar one of any kind of a fine or anything else that results from this problem is something that uh, you, the buyer, don't have to pay for that the seller does. Maybe there's an escrow to cover that. Right. When well, thinking about escrows and indemnification, I mean, we're also, you know, I, I think it'll kind of depend how people approach this on whether it's sort of a public, 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 private, private, True. private transaction as mm -hmm. well. In a public, public context, you know, how the risk shakes out is gonna be very different than a private-private context. And so um, that's just something you have to think about as well. So tell us about any examples of like what, what, would, what would be the deal breaker? Do you guys have examples yeah, of cases sure. where you've worked on where like this was a deal breaker for us and we walked away or somebody else walked away from you? I won't give the outcome as to whether they walked away or not. That's um, fine. But this is a kind of a blend of a couple scenarios. Um, close to the end of a transaction, someone discovers that there has been a breach, it's a state actor or someone affiliated with state actors, they've basically penetrated most of the internal systems of the company and in the process probably exfiltrated most of their IP. And the acquisition was an IP targeting acquisition. <laughs> That'll do it. <laughs> that might do it, yeah. That would, that would. What about a scenario where you've modified, maybe, maybe you're gonna modify the terms of the deal. You might modify um, integration of systems, for example, or delay an integration of systems until you've kind of flushed through what's happening at that target. 
or sort of staggered, um, stag staggered some of the elements of the deal that you may not have otherwise staggered? How have you guys treated that? So we had one where the seller had multiple customer accounts compromised, and we were brought in by the buyer to review it. And by the time we were done, it was much more extensive than the seller had thought. So that made the difference as to whether or not the, um, whether the seller was going to be plugged into the buyer mothership, if you will. Mm -hmm. So they put a lot of mitigation in place to prevent that, the metastasization, if that's even a real word, of the, um, of the infection over at the seller into the buyer. So. Okay. so I don't really have a cyber security or breach scenario here, but I have one example that sort of picks up on the discussion that was going on earlier about M&A uh, cross-border and CFIUS issues. So uh, we were representing, it is a company in the software business, we were representing a company called uh, Ness. This is all public, so what I talk about will be the public aspect of what happened. But um, Ness agreed to sell to a Chinese company, H&A Group, which also tried to buy Scott Amucci's firm, Skybridge, and some other investments. And essentially, they got wrapped up in CFIUS, and there's a condition to closing that there had to be a CFIUS approval. The Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States because you know you've got a Chinese buyer, US business, some national security issues. And at, at a certain point it became clear that the CFIUS approval would not be forthcoming um, in any reasonable time frame. And so you have a, a tough situation. You want to sell because you want to make a ton of money, right? right? But um, if you don't think you're going to get the regulatory approval, how long are you willing to wait in the Trump administration for an approval for a deal with China? Right, <laughs> unless it's ZTE, but um, yeah, exactly. So, uh, so, so, so you can sometimes have to pull the plug on a deal because you think a regulatory approval is not forthcoming. Right. Yeah, I, I think that's exactly right. I mean, one of the ways we would typically see this happen, especially in a private uh, company transaction, would be uh, a, a closing condition that the parties meet certain objectives regarding systems integration or have done certain things to identify and address whatever the underlying breach is. It could also be you know, a, a covenant um, that's not a pre-closing condition, but things like that that you can kind of bake into the agreement that provide a strong incentive for one party to actually accomplish what they're supposed to accomplish with regard to the remediation. The, the challenge, of course, is that sometimes these things may take a long time to resolve. It may seem like this is something that's simple and can be resolved in 60 days at the time that you're signing the agreement, and then it turns out to be a much bigger issue. And then you've essentially bound yourself to accept whatever they can do in, say, 60 days, or you've created a situation where you might have to walk out of the deal because the you know, closing condition isn't going to be true. Right. So you, it, it can get pretty complicated. I can imagine. Well, let's take a step back um, to thinking about the investigation. and. Mm -hmm getting our hands around the magnitude of the breach um, and considerations of how, how you're managing the investigation. Maybe first we'll talk about from a seller's perspective how you're gonna manage that investigation and then spin it into how the buyer, what, what the buyer's role is, if any, in the investigation or if they would be running a concurrent investigation and how that may all work. Who wants it to start? I call Ian Y. <laughs> yeah, so, Good answer. So I'll look at it from a, from a technical perspective, and you said seller's perspective. Yeah, yeah I mean, the, sell, um, like, you know, the seller's got the, the, you know, the target's got the responsibility and ownership of running it, right? But yeah, then at I some mean, point, the buyer may be a, either a part of it. They may be hiring separate a separate firm to shadow the investigation or do their own analytics yeah, on it. I don't think from a seller's perspective, I don't think you're going to run this investigation. I could be wrong, but I don't think you're going to run it much different than any other, right? What is right, the root right. cause? How did they get in here? What did they touch? What's our notification responsibilities regarding that? And as far as, I don't think I'm, I'm qualified to speak as, you know, as far as when the seller should bring the buyer in. I mean, I could talk about it from a technical perspective as to what you wanna do, but from a decision-making perspective as to when you're gonna bring the buyer in and whether you're gonna allow them to connect to your network, I think that's, uh, that's probably a little bit outside the scope of what I would normally deal with. I, I would just, so I would normally say to the buyer, yeah, you got to do it yourself. But whether the seller should allow that, that's, that's something different. Yeah, yeah I, I think that makes sense. I mean, the, the question of when do you notify the buyer, something, I mean, it's a quasi-legal, quasi-business, you know, analysis, right? I mean, legally, you're going to need to let the buyer know. I mean, if this is something that's, you know, material in any respect, you can't, you know, hide the ball. This has to be, you know, notified to the buyer. And so it's a question of when does that make sense, you know, strategically for, for the seller? Um, how much information do you want to convey, like, as a sort of opening salvo? Because if you provide everything you know right away, um, that may be enough to sort of, you know, 
address the buyer's concerns, or they may say, that's interesting, but here are these other questions we have, and if you don't have those answers, they're gonna wanna jump in and potentially try to connect with their systems, maybe have their own outside uh, consultants start looking at the issue themselves. Uh, as far as the question about how you conduct the investigation, I would say, being in a, like a merger context or an acquisition context is probably gonna light a fire under you that you might not otherwise have, but you probably should have anyway, so hopefully it's not ha handled any differently. But. Again, I don't really do cyber breaches per se, but if I'm representing the buyer of a target uh, and there's a problem, whether before or after signing, but you, you know, you're waiting yeah. to, to close, um, my general instinct is that I do not necessarily just trust the seller to do their job. No, that uh, was my next I, question. <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> I triple check everything that is going on. I use every avenue available to do an independent investigation and I question every step along the way because I can't tell you how many times that I have found problems at the target that they didn't know about. Mm -hmm. and, and so we're not there to help them, but I'm there to help my buyer. And right. so I'm not gonna go in and try to solve the problem for them. We can help them solve problems. Uh, my job is to help the buyer make sure they're not making a mistake. And I, I just have too many experiences where the seller didn't quite get it right. Yeah, before we even talk about what was found, I think to your point is, how did you find it? Yeah. You know, is it just, yeah, we ran a query and we think this is what we got. It was an internal sysadmin who did it. Or we've brought in another firm. They deployed their tool set. They covered 100% of the environment. These are the things we looked for. These are the things we found. This is our timeline. That's a very different kind of answer than, yeah, this is, or, or better yet, we hear a lot of times is we have no evidence of. So no evidence of can mean a few things. It means you've checked every log, you had logs that went back five years, and there's nothing. The other thing is you have no logs, you really didn't check, and that's why you have no evidence of it. Because, you know, a blind man has no evidence of a bank robbery. So all right, that's my, I guess that's my stupid metaphor for no, today. So. But it's absolutely true. I mean, like the, the scope of the investigation, like the scope of the inquiry, like what led to it, you're absolutely right. If it's coming from a thorough investigation, that's one thing. It also makes you query, you know, if you're the buyer, okay, well, what's, like, what's the delta between the analysis you're doing right now and what you've been doing for however many years prior where this breach might have been occurring or not occurring? Oh, and by the way, you discovered this happened in, say, you know, I don't know, January 2018. Well, how far back have you been looking? And, you know, what have you been doing to, you know, figure out if you have other things that you haven't discovered until now, right? Like, how thorough have you been? Because if I'm a buyer and you're starting to come up with issues during the merger process, I'm starting to wonder, well, okay, what else is under there? You've lifted up the rug a little bit. I see a little dirt. What else is under here? Mm -hmm. so. yeah, and there was one client that we had where actually it was an adversarial party where they said that they had an intrusion, went on for a year and a half, and that's because they said basically that's what's relevant to this. The reality is they had four different groups inside there, and the intrusion went back seven years. So you, you just have to be very careful about the parsing of words like, oh, well, you know, this attacker has been doing this for this long, right? Do you have evidence of other attackers inside there? You know, I, I wouldn't assume that they're giving you the full download in the first day or two. This is where the, the diligence calls turn into more of a deposition, yeah, if you will. Unfortunately. Um, yeah, unfortunately. But, yeah. 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 <laughs> so let's talk about um, confidentiality around this entire process and considerations that should be made um, both in terms of, you know, the circle around, you know, which we're going to draw, who, who knows about this, and um, how that potentially impact, you know, how is the circle potentially impacted when you've got at least one buyer, possibly more potential buyers, depending um, if, this if this would have been maybe something identified before you just signed and you were still maybe entertaining too. So we frequently get called in by the buyer to do this. So confidentiality, usually we have to overcome obstacles about relevance, about privilege and stuff like that. So it's usually a negotiation uh, conducted by the parties and their attorneys. Um, but usually we get around that. Usually it's not a problem. I mean, I, I think it's going to, you know, who you bring in, like within, you know, if you're the target and, and you've discovered this breach, I, I think it kind of behooves you to bring in the buyer, at least the relevant people in the buyer, once you have established some basics as far as like what's happened, mm -hmm. to have those conversations. Now, how that circle of trust, if you will, grows, I mean, if there's another party in the, in the, in the mix, like if, if, for instance, you're in negotiations with one potential buyer. You're not really in negotiations with the other buyer, but the other buyer might be interested. 
I don't think you necessarily have any obligation to be discussing this with them, nor should you be necessarily discussing this with them. Would you feel compelled to go to the government? Like you mentioned earlier, like if the FBI might be involved, for example, would you feel like you have to make sure it's okay with them before you start disclosing to yeah, I think, either buyer? Yeah, I, I think it, it, so it, it kind of depends, right? Like I think it would depend on the nature of the breach and, and the cyber incident, right? So like if it's sort of like, I don't want to say run-of-the-mill kind of thing, but it's something that's kind of a you know standard. Oh, we had this exposure. We've identified that you know potentially there was access to this database. We don't know if it was access, or if we know it was access, we can you know identify you know generally what's happened. I think you would most likely be in some conversation with law enforcement mm -hmm. and have a conversation with them about like what you could or could not really disclose. And there's ways you can disclose things to a buyer in a way that would not necessarily compromise an investigation, right? And so mm. I think you just have to be a little bit delicate there. I think from a seller perspective, you want to be careful that you're not minimizing an intrusion. So there's, so you have like, uh, you know, different strains of ransomware. 99% of the ransomware out there, it is somebody clicked something, it started infecting their computer and it moved through file shares and infected everything else. Not usually a, not usually a big deal. But there's other types of ransomware where it's actually based on the compromise of the network first and then the implantation of ransomware. So if you minimize that kind of infection, the reality is you had a wide scale intrusion into your environment before the guy decided to put ransomware on there. So understanding that not all pieces of malware are created equal and what the implications could be and you don't want to be at the 11th hour saying, yeah, it was just ransomware, and then have somebody from the buyer side saying, well, what kind of ransomware was it? And you know, we just ran into this recently with a client, and they're like, well, we're really not sure, we think it's this, but you know, it's just ransomware, because they really didn't understand that when you have an entire network being taken down by ransomware, there's a really good chance that the, net, that the individual who did it had, um, had a lot of access to the target's network first. One, one thing I would also point out, and, and this goes to what was just said, is that there's a fine line, I think, in negotiating between revealing too much so that you scare a potential buyer away, and revealing too little and saying too little and committing to too little you know, in the merger agreement and the disclosure schedules, so that there's a potential, if you're wrong, it gives rise to fraud. And so that's a tough balance to, to meet sometimes when you're operating in a fairly open information vacuum, right? Like you don't know all the facts and you're trying to you know, say enough to you know, convince the buyer that you have the situation under control and you are trying to explain to them you know, the material facts that you understand and do it in a way that doesn't freak them out, right? Because right. you don't want them to walk away thinking there's a big issue when actually it may not be that big, but also when you're committing to the agreement that um, you know, the representations you know, herein are actually true, you're not saying something that is ultimately false and you know, potentially opening yourself up to a fraud charge later. So how do you not freak somebody out? So I, I take it back to like, so in the FBI days, right? So little Billy goes missing. He was supposed to be at school. Little Billy never showed up to school. The school calls mom and dad around three o'clock saying, little Billy never showed up. Little Billy's not coming home. Nobody knows where little Billy is. So, right, so the problem is, you don't, well, I know, this so this is, this is my second good, stupid metaphor. <laughs> but right, Sam, like the reality stories. is, you wanna talk about panic. Yeah. Like you want to talk about like like we're dealing with malware and mergers and trans, uh, transactions. Let, let's fa let's face it, that pales in comparison to your kid being taken. So so what do you do? So what does the bureau normally do, right? So you normally see a podium, and the bureau guys get up there in the podium and they say, "This is what we're doing," right? We don't know where they're not going to say we don't know where Billy is, and we're all panicking here, <laughs> right? You kind of say this is the methodology we use, a well-proven methodology, and this is what we're going to do. That's how you don't freak people out. But do you really wait until 3 o'clock? No. <laughs> no. No, the school thought he was sick. No. So, yeah. Could I have gotten a call at 9? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if you were home, you would have gotten that call. It's, it's waiting in your voicemail, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah. But, I mean, I think it's interesting, you know, timing perspective, too, of then, you know, comparing that to what, when you do tell the buyer and when is it too early um, and then when does, like, to me, three o'clock as the mom is way too late, right? So right. It's also a question of when do you know about it, right? I mean, like, ideally, you would know about these things before you go into the transaction because some of the things that are happening early on in the transaction are in the negotiation of the actual terms of the agreement, right? Right. And 
if you've had something that's pretty material, you probably don't want to be negotiating, you know, representations and warranties that you haven't had that material thing, right? So, I mean, a lot of times, I mean, parties have become more and more sophisticated over the years in terms of their privacy and security representations and warranties and merger agreements. Historically, it used to be maybe a line or two in the IP section. Now, especially like in Silicon Valley deals, you'll see you know, two pages, you know, 20 paragraphs of representations and warranties about what the target you know, has or has not done with regard to privacy and data security. And so to the extent that you can have an awareness of what's going on and make that available in a data room or however you're having you know, your, your information exchange with the other party and convince them that like, you are not willing to agree to a rep representation that you have not done something like, uh, when you actually have, you know, the better you're going to be as far as the negotiations go in the long term, I think. So just for my benefit, what percentage of companies have a, who are in this, you know, sort of this space generally, is it 99% have had some kind of data breach or no. like is so, it that common? So it's, it's, it's sort of, there's the companies that know they've had a data breach and then there are companies that have had a data breach that don't know it yet, right? Like, I mean, that's basically pretty much everybody. everybody, right? So it's not really a, necessarily a material thing for well, a deal. Well, I think you're not looking for the breach, right, which is a legal term. You're really looking for the incident, and can they explain the incidents that they've had over the last year, 18 months, mm -hmm. and how they've put them to ground, right? They've really resolved those. I think that's the problem, is if you set the bar up here that we're only going to tell you about our breaches, well, that assumes that you had sufficient processes and technology in place to know you had a breach, right? Rather than, are you the blind man trying to report on a bank robbery? Right? You just, you don't know because you're not instrumented that way, you haven't escalated things, yeah. So, yeah, there's a difference. In, I mean, you're right. It's like it's like oh, there's a lot of different kinds of car accidents, right? And everybody yeah. gets into car accident, and like some car accidents are like oh, I back up into like you know the curb. There are yeah. other car accidents where you're going 95 and you total your car, right? And it's the ones on the latter end that you definitely want to be, if you're the buyer, more you know, cautious about it. Sure. Say. So switching gears slightly, as you know, as audience members and as just members of the general public, we've certainly seen in the news a variety of different incidences and breaches and um, concerns uh, that a variety of companies have had around um, data issues. So let's talk about kind of like the, the public relations aspect of this here. So, you know, we had talked about hiring investigative and forensic experts as a, another kind of outside entity that you would bring in to help cope with this incident or cope with the breach. Um, let's talk about the, you know, what perspectives you guys have on bringing in public relations professionals and kind of the considerations around managing anything that's going to be disclosed publicly, either intentionally or identified through, you know, news and other other areas. I think they're essential. I think you want to have... You, you think the, the PR I th experts are essential? I think the PR essential? experts are essential. I think if for no other reason they can tell you how not to create a news cycle. Yeah. Like, it's one thing you report a breach. Okay, everybody gets one bite at the apple. It's another thing to report specific numbers, to constantly change those numbers, to have different groups coming in and out, to constantly change your story. You, you don't want to constantly recreate the news cycle. And I think as far as PR goes, you want to be thinking about that before the breach day. Your incident response plan should lay out, these are what our holding statements are, this is how we deal with communication from different reporters, very, I think they're absolutely essential. I agree. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree. I mean, you know, many companies will have their own internal PR or comms teams that can address these, but yeah. in some cases they'll need to bring in outside consultants sometimes just to deal with it. Oftentimes, I mean, it depends on the nature of the breach. If it's a breach that, say, affects, you know, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of consumers, and you end up disclosing it. And say you've done everything right on the disclosure, right? So, you know, you haven't gone out and then had to go out again and then go out again and kind of like backtrack. I mean, one thing that's terrible is giving a notice of a data breach. What's worse is having to repeat it and correct it and revise it. Um, but say you do that right, you're still potentially going to need outside consultants to deal with the blowback and the tens of thousands of inquiries you might get. Uh, a lot of companies don't have call centers that are staffed with people to take in calls from, you know, consumers. But mm -hmm. if you're someone like, say, a Target, which has a data breach that affects, you know, millions and millions of Americans who are upset about their credit card information being exposed, it would be helpful to have a call center that has people that are trained in how to respond to customer inquiries and, you know, consumer inquiries about this. And so having comms consultants that can help you think about how is this all going to play out? What's the roadmap till this becomes nothing and you know it's in the rearview mirror is really important. 
One other aspect of that, of course, since I'm from Washington, D.C., is yeah. how do you yeah. handle with congressional yeah. investigations and yeah. hearings and things like that, right? So obviously yeah. Facebook went through that. You have to have consultants in Washington, D.C. who know how to handle a congressional uh, hearing, which is not an easy process. And they handled it very well, it seems to me. And I think a good PR firm is also going to have experts on hand that can educate the media to really separate the wheat from the chaff and kind of help the media understand Look, it's not about, you know, one server wasn't patched. It, it's more complex than that. Patching is a more complex and nuanced thing than, than maybe the media would have you believe. I think a good PR firm is going to have experts on standby that can help the media kind of understand what everything means, how big a deal it really is, rather than uh, just, just have the media reach out to people who are just going to lob grenades at the company. Right. Yeah. yeah. So taking it back to our little case study here of East Corp versus West Corp. How much involvement, if any, is the buyer having around some of this management of, of the public, relation, public relations and consumption of the information? Assuming we've signed the deal and let's assume you know, the buyer's comfortable going forward in the deal, how, how involved is the buyer in any of this? If you've signed the deal, the buyer is gonna to wanna to control the whole process. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if, they, you've, they, already, yeah, if they you've signed it, I'm gonna make sure that they're yeah. hiring the consultants that I uh, right. approve. Yeah. Right. That's, I mean, yeah, that's yeah. a case we just finished, exactly that. Yeah. Like we, we looked at the logs ourselves, we looked at the machines ourselves. It was thanks, you know, we got the initial story and then it's, we're gonna, we're gonna validate everything that's been said here. So we know what to mitigate when it comes on board. Yeah. 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 Oh, sorry, I thought I had, saw a hand for another question. Um, so again, kind of keeping in this vein of the case study and the buyer's considerations, you know, we've talked about some of the considerations that the buyer may have, whether it being, you know, modifying terms of the engagement agreement, possibly backing out of, or terms of the merger agreement, possibly backing out of the deal. Um, let's talk through a few more of those, if you guys um, are willing to, and thinking about, like, what's, the, you know, how do you analyze as a buyer what impact this really will have on a transaction? How do you analyze if it's going to be a purchase price adjustment or if it's going to be some type of modification to terms, if it's going to be a delay in the timing? Um, you know, I think we've got a lot of potential buyers and experienced buyers in the room here. So help, help the audience members think through that process from a buyer's perspective and how you're analyzing some of those considerations. So my initial two questions like, would basically be, one, why, why are we buying this company? Right, like what, what is the, like no, but seriously, what is the value prop here? Like, if we're doing this as an IP play, right, and say the incident you know involves IP, that's something that's material. Likewise, the other question is, what is the incident, right? If this is an IP play, but what actually was exposed was say some information about employees, then maybe it isn't that significant. And so, thinking about those two things will help guide whether or not you know this is something that just gets folded into the representations, warranties, and disclosure schedule, or if this becomes a closing condition, or you know, God help us, some kind of you know purchase price adjustment, which is, by the way, exceedingly rare and hard to do, um, and, and very rarely happens in the context of cyber issues. So I deal in a world where there are uh, fines, serious fines for companies for violating FCC law. So I'm familiar with that. It's sort of easy for me to I know because we can actually research. You know, what's the likely fine if somebody does X, Y, or Z? It's going to be between 100,000 and 500,000, or it might be 1 million to 10 million. And so it's actually relatively easy for me to get a sense of what's at risk, honestly. So that is pretty easy. What I'm hearing, though, on the cyber side, I'm not really sure if there, first of all, if there are discrete fines that you might be subject to. And also, it sounds like a lot of these things may not really be material. So. I'm not sure how much of a purchase price adjustment is actually necessary. So it, it could run, and what's interesting, I mean, you know, I say this as a privacy and, and data security lawyer who's been working for the past two years on our company's GDPR uh, efforts, but in the future, breaches may become much, much more material from a legal right. liability standpoint, right? right? So right now, it, there isn't like a clear um, guideline, you know, from the FTC or any other regulator, like there would be from the FCC, as far as like what like fine schedule you might hit, right? Mm -hmm. Now you can look at F, you know, FTC precedent and see, kind of you know, analogizing between similar cases where there have been breaches where the FTC has found that you know either a company misrepresented their data security practices or their data security practices were you know essentially unfair to consumers, and so the FTC would penalize the company, and usually 
that would end up not being too significant. I mean, the maximum fine paid thus far to the FTC for you know data security privacy issues, I, I believe, is still the $22.5 million fine that Google paid uh, about four years ago. So not really all that material. Um, there could be state penalties. There could be litigation, right? And litigation you know, can be extremely costly. We've seen Target's paid you know, tens of millions of dollars. And Yahoo, I believe, has paid a significant amount as well, especially Target, because they had to pay issuers, the banks, the affected citizens, all of that. Um, but going into May 25th, when the GDPR comes into effect in Europe, if you don't notify a regulator within a pretty specified time period, um, and you fail to have an adequate reason as to why you did not notify them, then you're potentially facing fines, um, depending on the severity of the violation, of up to 4% of the company's global revenue. And so that can be pretty material pretty quickly, right? I mean, it you know, kind of bears watching as to whether that kind of penalty will actually be levied in the case of a breach, but my suspicion is that there will be regulators out there that seek to leverage that kind of uh, you know, penalty power. What about insurance? What about the target's insurance policies on any of this, and how could that play in? They may be helpful. I mean, it's interesting, right? Like, so insurance can cover certain things, right? Okay. Insurance can cover, you know, costs for replacing systems. It can cover some of the costs of, you know, addressing notification and, and sort of the response to a breach. They often won't you know, do anything for, say, brand equity damage, right, or IP loss or things like that. Right. And so it can be helpful, but it's really going to depend on the facts. What I, where I've seen insurance kind of hamstring a, uh, an investigation is that sometimes they'll have a panel and some, uh, some groups on that panel, forensic investigators, will be very, very good, and some on that panel will be very, very bad. And, but for that panel, the very, very bad ones would never be working this kind of a breach. And then you get stuck getting a report from a forensic firm that just isn't, um, isn't doing it the way it should be done. And I think I have seen that um, kind of create difficulties where difficulties didn't need to be created. That also happens with law firms. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's the same thing. And so it can be a bad situation where a company, in order to you know, comply with their insurance you know, policy, is going to have to pick a law firm they might not otherwise pick. And so it leaves some of the more competent law firms out on the lurch because they're expensive, because they're actually really yeah. good at what they do. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, I think we've certainly scared the pants off of most of the people in the audience listening to this conversation. Um, but before we open it up for audience questions, any parting thoughts or um, suggestions that you guys haven't felt like you've gotten to touch yet, either from a buyer's or seller's perspective, key takeaways? I don't think so. We've touched on a lot. Yeah, yeah. Keep, keep your eyes open and dig in. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. If you haven't figured out what GDPR is yet, you're in yeah. trouble. <laughs> yeah, that's a t topic for another panel, but yeah, that's, that's a big topic. Yeah, yeah and I, I will say most intrusions, most breaches are more extensive than you're initially told. Absolutely. Not because uh, they're malicious in the way they tell you, it's just because they don't know. Mm -hmm. yeah. So this is, you know, this topic's about post post diligence or during diligence finding the breach. But what are companies doing, or what do you suggest companies do, in order to mitigate some of the risk in terms of like penetration testing or any kind of bug bounties or anything like that to actually uh, stem the tide of vulnerabilities? So I think so. With pen testing, it can be more of an art than a science. So what you're really doing is you're testing the pen tester. You're not testing the network. So the, you, know, you get really high speed pen testers, they're gonna break into everything, right? So it, are, do you have a less secure or more secure? You get a less capable pen tester, um, they're gonna say this is good, and really it may not be. Um, I, my take is almost all incidents can be traced, or all, all breaches can be traced back to incidents that the company already knows about. That it's a series of missteps that the company may have had malware in certain places or account compromises, and those weren't really fully run to ground. If you understand the root cause as to why they weren't run to ground, that'll tell you where else to look. That's just been my experience with it. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I would echo that. I think pen testing in general is good. If you can get a good pen testing team, even better. Um, bug bounty programs, 
can work. We can, uh, we've also seen some bug bounty programs that have you know, turned out poorly. So it depends on you know, how it's structured and how it's run. Um, and also, honestly, you know, to what I was saying earlier in terms of having an information security policy and program that's you know, built to actually meet your organization's needs, I think that would be you know, ideal. And testing your incident response plan, you know, doing sandbox exercises is also a key thing. Like, if, if you have a plan and you never dusted it off or tried it out, how do you know how the team is going to do when it actually comes to you know, put your feet to you know, the ground and start running? Mm -hmm. So I, I think that would be pretty key as well. And I think you can see like some of the sticking points here was not like we didn't go over malware reversing or searching for IPs. It was all these decision points. That's what I think really needs to get hammered home on the tabletop exercises is, is think through these things before it happens. Like we can teach people on how to analyze malware and how to how to forensically analyze machines and network traffic. It's a lot more difficult at, on the heat of the moment to say, are we calling the FBI? Are we telling the buyer? And th those are things that you really want to have answers to, I think, ahead of time. Mm -hmm. That's great. Other questions? Um, can I sneak in one more? Would you suggest that in a future state, we're going to see drafting of purchase agreements that anticipate the potential for a breach before closing? and articulate out behaviors and remedies and actions that would take place right at the initial onset of a deal? Is that, is that where we evolve the practice to, to be someday? Um, my, my take on that would be that a lot of purchase and merger agreements already kind of think about this, right? It would be, you'll see representations that, you know, as of the time of, you know, the closing or as of the time of the agreement, or there has never, essentially clauses that would say, there has never been a never, you know, to our knowledge, you know, is not any data security incident and, and so on. And so I, I think that the buyers are certainly already trying to assign the risk of this to, to the target companies. Um, as far as how it shakes out, if one of these things comes up during the diligence or during the negotiation process, I think that's something else. I don't think that that's going to be addressed in the agreement itself, but I think that there might be more standards of practice that kind of evolve around that, where there, you know, as these things happen more frequently, norms become established as to what the buyer's role is and what the target's role is and you know, how, how people should operate. And I wonder from a technical perspective if, if people are going to start thinking as, as they do more mergers and acquisitions, how do we control assumed affection, infection? Right? We're going to have a presumed infection in this thing that we're buying. How do we control that so it doesn't spread across into the mothership? I think people are going to give that more and more thought. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you.